he saw deep connections between the heavens and the earth. Man, he said, is a microcosm, a little cosmos. Democritus came from the Ionian town of Abdera, on the northern Aegean shore. In those days, Abdera was the butt of jokes. If around the year 400 BC, in the equivalent of a little outdoor restaurant like this, you told a story about someone from Abdera, you were guaranteed a laugh. It was, in a way, the Brooklyn of its time. For Democritus, all of life was to be enjoyed and understood. In fact, for him, understanding and enjoyment were pretty much the same thing. He said, a life without festivity is a long road without an inn. Democritus may have come from Abdera, but he was no dummy. Democritus understood that the complex forms, changes, and motions of the material world all derive from the interaction of very simple moving parts. He called these parts atoms. All material objects are collections of atoms intricately assembled, even we. When I cut this apple, the knife must be passing through empty spaces between the atoms, Democritus argued. If there were no such empty spaces, no void, then the knife would encounter some impenetrable atom and the apple wouldn't be cut. Let's compare the cross sections of the two pieces. Are the exposed areas exactly equal? No, said Democritus. The curvature of the apple forces this slice to be slightly shorter than the rest of the apple. If they were equally tall, then we'd have a um, cylinder and not an apple. No matter how sharp the knife, these two pieces have unequal cross sections. But why? Because on the scale of the very small, matter exhibits some irreducible roughness. And this fine scale of roughness, Democritus of Abdera identified with the world of the atoms. His arguments are not those we use today, but they're elegant and subtle and derived from everyday experience. And his conclusions were fundamentally right. Democritus believed that nothing happens at random, that everything has a material cause. He said, I would rather understand one cause than be king of Persia. He believed that poverty in a democracy was far better than wealth in a tyranny. He believed that the prevailing religions of his time were evil and that neither souls nor immortal gods existed. There is no evidence that Democritus was persecuted for his beliefs. But then again, he came from Abdera. However, in his time, the brief tradition of tolerance for unconventional views was beginning to erode. For instance, the prevailing belief was that the moon and the sun were gods. Another contemporary of Democritus named Anaxagoras taught that the moon was a place made of ordinary matter and that the sun was a red-hot stone far away in the sky. For this, Anaxagoras was condemned, convicted, and imprisoned for impiety, a religious crime people began to be persecuted for their ideas. A portrait of Democritus is now on the Greek hundred drachma note. But his ideas were suppressed and his influence on history made minor. The mystics were beginning to win. You see, Ionia was also the home of another quite different intellectual tradition. Its founder 
was Pythagoras, who lived here on Samos in the 6th century BC. According to local legend, this cave was once his abode. Maybe that was once his living room. Many centuries later, this small Greek Orthodox shrine was erected on his front porch. There's a continuity of tradition from Pythagoras to Christianity. Pythagoras seems to have been the first person in the history of the world to decide that the Earth was a sphere. Perhaps he argued by analogy with the, the moon or the sun. Uh, maybe he noticed the curved shadow of the Earth on the moon during a lunar eclipse. Or maybe he recognized that when ships leave Samos, their masts disappear last. Pythagoras believed that a mathematical harmony underlies all of nature. The modern tradition of mathematical argument, essential in all of science, owes much to him. And the notion that the heavenly bodies move to a kind of music of the spheres was also derived from Pythagoras. It was he who first used the word cosmos to mean a well-ordered and harmonious universe, a world amenable to human understanding. For this great idea, we are indebted to Pythagoras. But there were deep ironies and contradictions in his thoughts. Many of the Ionians believed that the underlying harmony and unity of the universe was accessible. Through observation and experiment, the method which dominates science today. However, Pythagoras had a very different method. He believed that the laws of nature could be deduced by pure thought. He and his followers were not basically experimentalists. They were mathematicians, and they were thoroughgoing mystics. They were fascinated by these five regular solids, bodies whose faces are all polygons, triangles or squares or pentagons. There can be an infinite number of polygons, but only five regular solids. Four of the solids were associated with earth, fire, air, and water. The cube, for example, represented earth. These four elements, they thought, make up terrestrial matter. So the fifth solid, they mystically associated with the cosmos. Perhaps it was the substance of the heavens. This fifth solid was called the dodecahedron. Its faces are pentagons, 12 of them. Knowledge of the dodecahedron was considered too dangerous for the public. Ordinary people were to be kept ignorant of the dodecahedron. In love with whole numbers, the Pythagoreans believed that all things could be derived from them, certainly all other numbers. So a crisis in doctrine occurred when they discovered that the square root of two was irrational. That is, the square root of two could not be represented as the ratio of two whole numbers, no matter how big they were. Irrational originally meant only that, that you can't express an, uh, a number as a ratio. But for the Pythagoreans, it came to mean something else, something threatening, a hint that their worldview might not make sense, the other meaning of irrational. Instead of wanting everyone to share and know of their discoveries, the Pythagoreans suppressed the square root of two and the dodecahedron. The outside world was not to know. The Pythagoreans had discovered, in the mathematical underpinnings of nature, one of the two most powerful scientific tools. The other, of course, is experiment. Instead of using their insight to advance the collective voyage of human discovery, they made of it little more than the hocus-pocus of a mystery cult. Science and mathematics were to be removed from the hands of the merchants and the artisans. This tendency found its most effective advocate in a follower of Pythagoras named Plato. He preferred the perfection of these mathematical abstractions to the imperfections of everyday life. <laughs>